Welcome. God bless you. So good to be with you. This is the ninth message in our series, To the Intent You May Believe. Our text has been John chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. Well, let's get right after. We're going to pick up the narrative in verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you might believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. The title for this message is, For Your Sakes. Your sakes. For this cause, for this reason, why I'm doing what I'm doing about right now. I'm following the Father's instruction, but there's a reason for it. It's not the only reason, but it's the main reason. Jesus is exemplifying to his disciples that he's training and teaching for the ministry of the church that's about to be birthed. If you really want to do something for yourself, do something for others. I used to run. I started running when I was 49 because I was uh, way overweight and uh, my health wasn't that good. And so I felt like I going to start running. When I first started, it was really a slow process. <clears throat> but eventually I got to where I could run two to three miles and I would do it five days a week or so. And I ran till I was 62. And, um, I mean, religiously I ran. And I had a routine. When I would get ready to take off, I would quote this verse, or verses, it's in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, 4, and 5, it says this, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Know ye not that they who run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Every man that striveth for the masteries is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep unto my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now when you say that for 12 years, <laughs> several times a week as you get ready to run, you just never forget that. Uh, but I did it for the gospel's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Paul says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. Doing something for the sake of others is good for your own sake as well. And there are a number of other verses. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, Be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Well, <clears throat> he was doing this for their faith. But he was exemplifying his faithfulness. You can't take one attribute of God and separate it from all the other attributes. This is who God is. Like he's holy, he's just, he's merciful. He is also faithful. But in his humanity, in the garden of Gethsemane, probably the darkest hour of the life of Christ, in fact, he said, um, Father, all things are possible. If thou wilt, let the cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That humanity, deity, struggle, exemplifying to us his humanity. He said, my soul, he said to his disciples, Peter, James, and John, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Pray for me, watch and pray. Well, we know that Christ is faithful. I just wonder what... <clears throat> purpose for our sakes, he showed that wrestling and yet came through so faithful. Well, Revelation 19, 11, when you come into our house above the main front window, we have a plaque that our son-in-law and daughter made for us, and it says this, And behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, Faithful is he who calleth you, <clears throat> who also will do it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, <clears throat> There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear. I have several other verses. I think I'll omit them. Um, I want to get back to Lazarus is dead and, and get us a picture of this. He's doing this for their sakes. When he says Lazarus is dead, there's a mental picture of Lazarus in the mind of each of these disciples. And it's one common to people in this day. 
some of the details. When a person died, they would take the body and they would wash it. Then they would treat it with fragrant oils and spices, those kinds of things. And then they would band with grave cloths the hands over the chest like this, and they would figure eight around the hands, and they would also bind their feet. Then they would wrap them in a linen sheet, um, their body, and then they would place a napkin over their face, and they would place the body on a bier. Now, a bier would be a wooden carriage that was constructed, if you said a casket today, you would know that's where they place bodies. Well, they would place them on a carriage or a buyer, and then they would transport, they would have two to three guys on either side of this buyer, this wooden carriage, and they would transport the body to the cemetery or to the tomb where it was going to be laid. And so when they said Lazarus is dead, they would begin to think about that. In fact, in John chapter 11, verse 44, this, by the way, this description they said, um, well, let me read this for you. John chapter 11, it says this, verse 44, when, they, when he called Lazarus forth, he said this, And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a cloth. Very similar to how Jesus, when Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, provided the spices, the oils, the fragrances, they would have taken the body of Jesus on a buyer, which, just like there are caskets makers, they were buyer makers. Paul Bearer is where we get that from, the men who carry this carriage. They would have taken the body of Jesus and washed it, cleansed the blood from it, those kinds of things. They would have wound him, they would have bound his hands so it would lay across his chest like this and his feet, and they would have wrapped him in the linen grave cloths and put a napkin upon his face. The widow of Nain. Nain is a town about five miles southeast of Nazareth where Jesus grew up. He may have known this woman. But let me read a little bit about this. They give you this picture again. And it came to pass, Luke chapter 7 and verse 11, the next day that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and many people. And when he came near to the city gate, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and many people of the city were with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, the, the carriage, the wooden carriage that they're carrying the body of this wrapped dead son in. He stopped, the, which was very uncommon. They stopped for a moment. They saw Jesus. This is what he did. And they who bore, the son, bore him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him into his mother. Now there's, there's a lot of details left out of this. He's bound like this. He's laying on an open buyer, headed toward the cemetery. He touches the buyer, tells him, Would you stop? They stop. He tells the son, Arise. He sets up and begins to speak, probably the napkin over his face, slid down. I, we don't have the details, but I wonder what these pallbearers thought. Some of them probably wanted to drop that thing and run, but they didn't. But I'm sure they sat it down. Oh, we're not taking this live man to the cemetery. Now, bear this in mind as we think about Lazarus is dead. In the mental picture these disciples have of this. Now, Jesus said, I'm glad. That seems so strange a response. The Greek word is kereos. It means this, to rejoice, be delighted, and it is safe to say it is even, when he said glad, it was accompanied with a smile, a smile of confidence, not some giddy, foolish kind of smile. This is a smile of confidence, I think similar to what David would have said in Psalms 42 and verse 5. Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The help of his countenance. A smile is a universal language. One uh, that diffuses people. 
uh, any animosity or suspicions or those kinds of things. When he said, I am glad, he left them, I believe, with a smile of confidence that they probably recalled a number of times later on in their own journey of faith. His countenance is an outward expression of an inward condition. We need to know this about God. Jesus himself, if you, he is the express image of the invisible God. In this same chapter when he says, I'm glad that he's dead, as he finally comes and they're on their way to the cemetery, Jesus sees the people weeping, and it says in John 11:35, Jesus wept. An emotion. We're supposed to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Jesus is the example we're supposed to be following. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in all the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man upon the earth. And he said, it grieved him at his heart. From being glad, to weeping, to being grieved at his heart. Hebrews 4.15 is a verse we all should love. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus experienced those. He exemplified those to his disciples. Well, I'll close with this thought. The Greek word for glad is kerios. Its root word is charis, which is where we get the word grace from. In John chapter 1, Verses 14, 16, and 17 say this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace upon grace. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It is good for us to remember during times of trial or times of ease, any time in life or even in death, remember the smile of God's grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. For you, and for their sakes. He did these things for our sakes. Well, until then, next week will be our concluding message and I am looking so forward to it. It may be my favorite message in this whole series. But until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.